Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray again from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this review, I want to look at the issue of focus of attention and attentional focus and how it plays a role in both learning a new skill and in controlling a skill in a well-learned performer. And in particular, I want to look at an uh, article that kind of takes a new tack on that, that, that tack on this that I think is really interesting. So as I think most people know, there's a long history of research, you know, led by Gabby Wolf and colleagues and several other stu studies that have shown a clear advantage for an uh, external focus of attention, right? So focusing on the outcome of your movement, the effect your movement produces on either a, a tool like a golf club or a ball, rather than focusing internally on the actual movement of your body that produced that outcome. And as I said, you know, I've covered this on the podcast many times now. Um, there has been the common explanations for this. There's really two main ones that we can look at for the why this benefit occurs. The first is in terms of uh, information processing explanation. And that is the one that Gabby Wolf has talked about the most, the constrained action hypothesis. And this is the idea from the classic Fitz and Posner model that we learn a skill by transitioning from being very controlled and using declarative knowledge to becoming very automatic at a skill. And the idea is that when you direct attention internally, for example, you tell an athlete, think about the, your foot position or think about your elbow is bending, it disrupts this automaticity. So it's gonna hurt expert performance by disrupting automaticity. In the ecological approach, the idea here is that internal instructions are constrained, right? An instruction is a constraint that is going to affect the degree to which you can self-organize, right? So if I give you a very internally focused constraint focusing on your body, the idea is it's not going to let you as much room to explore and self-organize to different movement solutions. And so these are kind of the two main ones. Um, they haven't really been teased apart or, or explored, compared, and contrasted very much. Uh, as I said in a long, for a long time, one of the things that kind of has frustrated me about this literature is the ad nauseum, and I've added to this myself, is the ad nauseum repeat of the experiment where you compare, compare internal versus external instructions for a new skill. I don't think we need to do any more of those, to be honest. I'm telling you, right? We know that there's an external advantage. What we need to do is get into the, some of the subtleties, vary the types of external, instru external instructions, and see how they are, are affecting the performance. What are, the, what, you know, what are these explanations and things like that? I think that's where we really need to go, right? instead of doing the basic standard external versus internal experiment. And that's what was done in this recent paper published in Human Movement Science by Michael Maloney and Adam Gorman. They were looking at uh, attentional focus in swimming, in particular looking at elite swimmers. And what they note is, right, if we want to continue on and kind of expand on that ecological explanation for the external focus benefit, the idea is that an external focus is going to benefit because really in, in self-organization, right, the coordination is happening at the level of the joints, the level of the forces, the muscle forces. So it's not happening at the higher level of, ang you know, joint positions and things, right? So um, if we focus attention internally, we're kind of disrupting the system, right? It's kind of, in the, some ways, it's like a boss coming into a mail room, right, and giving orders, right? The, the mail room knows how to get things done. Right? When you come in and you start trying to give le orders, higher level orders about the positions and movements of joints, you're going to disrupt the coordinative structures, right? The develop at the, that are happening at the lower level. Okay. Um, so the, we get this kind of suboptimal organization. One way that this has been shown, which is the last point on this slide, is when you measure surface EMG. What you find is you get higher levels of surface EMG with an internal focus. More muscle activity of the thing you're focusing on, again, suggesting that the self-organization is happening differently when you're doing uh, internal focus. Another thing that kind of the authors build on in this paper is kind of some of the inconsistencies in the literature, right? Although there is this very, very strong trend and a lot of research showing the benefits of internal focus of attention, the story is really not that simple. And, and, and I've kind of pointed this out in a few different ways. In particular, when you look at experts, you do not always find this 
de the decrement in performance with internal and the benefit with external. Okay. And the thing that the authors of this paper want to test is that maybe the reason this doesn't occur is because athletes, elite athletes are actually ad better at adapting to constraints, right? Which we would presume they're more adaptable. And an instruction to either focus internally or in externally is just another constraint. Maybe they can just handle it better when you tell them, right? And so that's kind of the, the one of the things they wanted to test. Okay, so the research questions in the study, they're going to look at skilled divers, okay, and they're going to test them under internal and external focus of attention instruction conditions, so different constraints. And what they want to do is they're predicting is there's going to be no performance differences, right? The, the athletes are going to be able to adapt to these different task constraints easily, maintaining their performance. But what we will see is a difference in the underlying processes the kinematics, the kinetics, because the different constraints through the different instructions are going to make you self-organize differently, the elite swimmer, the elite divers, right? So the this is what they, they wanted to do. So these are swimmers. They're not divers. They're swimmers doing a dive start, okay? Um, so what they had was nine highly skilled swimmers from a, recruited from a national training center, they did uh, testing on two separate days. On one day, they had internal instructions. On the other, they had external with the order counterbalanced. The internal structure, very similar, modeled after the standard wolf manipulation. Internal, complete a maximal effort start while focusing on pushing with your feet. Your feet is looking at how you produce the movement through body movement, so it's internal. The other group was external. Complete a maximal effort start while focusing on pushing the blocks away, right? So we're getting you to focus on pushing, but here not the the uh, the how you push the movement of your feet, but the effect your push has on the environment on the blocks, right? So this is a very standard way to create contrast internal and external. And what they looked at in terms of performance, they also did the very um, kind of um, manipulation check where you ask people to repeat the, the instructions and ask how much they follow them. You know, if you listen to back to episodes, I have always questioned how effective this is as a manipulation check, but you can you can look at that uh, later on. Um, what they found was in terms of outcome measures, they looked at the peak power, they looked at the horizontal velocity, and they look at time it took them to reach five meters from the takeoff point, okay? So they're looking at three different measures of, of performance outcomes. They also did multiple uh, process measures, so kinematic and temporal measures, the time um, where they were in contact with the block, the, the vertical velocity, the acceleration, the forces. And most importantly, as you'll see, they looked at the timing of the different forces. So when did the peak acceleration occur? When did the peak vertical force occurred? S so on. Right? So that was the main thing that was measured in the study. What was found? So as predicted for all the performance variables, right? There was no significant difference between the conditions, right? So the, per, the swimmers could produce the exact same outcomes in terms of power, time to reach a certain distance in both the internal and external conditions. So this supports their idea that the performers could adapt to the constraint. However, what they found were underlying that were differences in how the movement was organized. In particular, there's the difference in the horizontal acceleration, okay, with lower values in the internal condition compared to external, which may like that that may suggest that the external is better, right? You're getting uh, more acceleration. But the main finding was in terms of timing, right? So you can see here um, what we have is the timing of the peak grab force, timing of vertical force, horizontal force. Um, below is is the actual values, right? what was the peak horizontal force? As you can see, it was no different in terms of the internal ex external, but there was a difference in terms of the when the timing of it when occurred. And what was found, these were all significant effects. Um, what there was found was the external was occurring earlier, right? So the, the peaks were occurring earlier in the movement with external instructions, right? So we're getting a difference in how the movement is coordinated and organized without an actual difference in the outcome. Right. And this is something uh, overall lesson. I think it's important to think about when you talk about constraints. Right. You can constraints can affect coordination. A change in constraints could affect coordination without affecting the movement outcome. That's the essential 
of repetition without repetition, right? Um, you're repeating the outcome you're, by organizing differently in response to the constraints, okay? So the authors conclude from this that while um, skilled swimmers are, they're not uh, detrimentally affected by an internal focus of attention because they're, they're better adapted, they're more adaptable, right? They're, sk they're skilled, highly trained swimmers. They can self-organize under these different conditions. However, the self-organization under the external condition appeared to be superior, right? We had that greater horizontal acceleration. We had also had the timing were occurring earlier of the maximal force. They were reaching maximal forces earlier. So we're still getting some benefit for external focus, but it's not just in terms of outcomes. So as I said, I really like this study. You know, there's some limitations of, you know, maybe the sample size is kind of small. There's no control condition, et cetera. But what I really like about it is they're going beyond the standard comparison, right? It's time to move on. Why do these different instructions have their effect? How do they affect self-organization? I really like this, this study, and I hope people continue to move in this direction, as, as I said, instead of doing the standard internal versus external comparison. Um, so, and, and this is something the authors express themselves in the paper, right? It's time to move beyond that a dichotomous internal is bad, external is good, and look at how they affect different types of, of uh, behavior. How do instructional constraints, the wording of them, affect how we self-organize under different contexts, right? So I, I totally agree with that. I think it's a really where we want it. There's still lots to do in focus of attention research, but I think we need to move in this kind of more getting into the subtleties of it um, now instead of the, the basic effect. Okay, that's it for today's episode, uh, the, you know, review. Um, thanks for joining me. If you want to, uh, if you're enjoying these reviews and you want to help support, you know, the, the cost of you know, producing the equipment, et cetera, uh, please consider going over to patreon.com and dropping me a few uh, shekels. Um, also there, there's multiple bonus contents in terms of the podcast, in terms of uh, transcripts, and even up to if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one consulting with me. So thanks for listening and cheers for now.